Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. Tonight, I'm going to be moderating and filming the event. Tonight's speaker is Stansfield Smith. He's going to be talking about China tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, there is a speaker. I mean, first we'll have announcements. Second, we'll have the speaker's presentation. Third, there will be questions and answers. And fourth, we'll be our infamous rebuttal period with our speaker having the last word. Um, the rules of the college are, there's two simple rules. One is no personal attacks. And the other one is one fool at a time. And usually that's the fool with the microphone. Tonight, June 1st, we are, again, um, esteemed with the uh, esteemed person, Stansfield Smith. He's going to be giving his presentation on his 24-day trip to China with some pictures. Speaker states that China is rapidly advancing, investing a great amount in infrastructure and housing. Poverty has almost been eliminated, with 700 million Chinese lifted out of poverty in the last 40 years. China remains a socialist country with a fair amount of capitalism, but the capitalism does not dominate. In its development, China is outstripping the United States. It is also making giant strides in taking action against causes of global warming. Truly revolutionary changes have been taking place. And Stan, if you're ready, let's welcome Stansfield Smith to the College of Complexes. Let's give him a round of applause, please. Oh.
potatoes. Okay. Soup? Oh, you didn't have soup. What do you got? Cream of you said put the gyro on and I don't have the gyro in my hand yet. I have one under control. I've got it. Let's welcome it. I've got it under control. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me here. Um, I went to China in March with my wife who speaks Chinese so I could go places the rest of us wouldn't be able to go to because we don't speak Chinese, we'd be pretty lost. Ladies and gentlemen. Usually, I mean, if I went on a tour with other U.S. people, you really could go to Beijing, Shanghai, Xi'an, and I don't know if any of you have been to China. Nobody? No. But I wanted to go to see a lot of uh, tourist places in the south and the southwest of China that you cannot go to on a tour, which, you know, if you went on a tour from the United States, it cost a lot of money. But you just go by yourself, it's pretty cheap. I mean, even the airplane from Chicago to Shanghai non-stop was just $640 round trip. And I think including that, I think we spent maybe $2,300 each, including the airplane. Um, I wrote here on this map, which doesn't really show the cities too clearly, the letters, where we went. And I figured, I was going to talk more about China, but then I figured, well, probably nobody's Going to, here is going to be able to go to these places because if you don't speak English and you don't hire a guide, it's like you can't you can't go. It would be too expensive. So I'll just kind of try to run through a lot of pictures I have a lot and I want to make sure I get through them. Uh, this first one, this is Nanjing. You know the Nanjing Massacre when the Japanese came into Nanjing in 1937? They killed 300 to 350,000 people in a month. They just massacred the city. This is a memorial we went to to the, to the people who got massacred in that city. And I think in all, I think about 25 million Chinese got killed in World War II, which is about the same as what got killed in the Soviet Union. The United States is what, half a million got killed? China was 25 million. I saw this the first day I was there, I thought it was a music. <laughs> this is don't believe that you're your tour guide on the road. <laughs> and please pay attention to the consumption trap. <coughs> it's a good thing to have in a tourist spot somewhere in the country. <laughs> I don't know what that. I also went to the Sun Yat Sen Mausoleum, which is in uh, Nanjing. But that's not it. I don't know what, where that picture went to. What is it? What's the memorial? If you know the Sun Yat Sen, he was like the founder of modern China. He's a national hero both in China and in Taiwan. This place is a railroad station way. We took the train from uh, Shanghai all the way to Kunming over here. Kunming's I wrote. It was like a high-speed train. It took like ten and a half hours. It goes like over 200 miles an hour. Maybe two, 225, 250. And it was only like 120 dollars. This is only this is a little city for China. It's like three million people, but this is their new railroad station. They have two railroad stations there. I mean, it's not even a very important city. I'm just impressed that you can't see any railroad stations in Chicago looking like this. This is the inside of the station with the seats. You can see how 
modern it was. After I was there a couple of days, I started taking pictures. Like I was, I went to China in 2005 and 2013, and the change that I saw from the last time I went there is just amazing. How they just rebuilding the country just kind of gets rebuilt every five years or so. Even when I went to Beijing in 2005 and 2013, in 2005 Beijing had four subway lines. 2013 they had 14 subway lines. And that's, I mean, it, I don't know how many they would have now. They just, like, they're doing this constantly. Everything, Chicago, what, I moved here in 1977. They built the Orange Line, which is not a subway line. And they built the extension to O'Hare, and that's all Chicago has really done with their subway system in this city. And I'd say the the worst subways I was on in Beijing or in China were better than the best ones I've been on in this country, which really shows when I was there, you get to see how much this country spends on the military that China does not. It spends on its infrastructure. Now this is also the train station there. This is like what the average train station looks like. This is a platform on that train station. This is outside the train station going, I think, near to a, a place called the Stone Forest. These are all uh, greenhouses. And I, I took a lot of pictures of all the modern buildings, which I saw everywhere in China. These are all modern high-rise buildings. They're just everywhere. This is a place called the Stone Forest, which is just all these stones up, like, the whole area looks like that. That's my wife. Chinese always take pictures. She was making fun of what the Chinese do, because they always make a picture. <laughs> and these were some country people's homes just out in the countryside, we'd pass on the train. I don't know if you've been to Europe, you go on a high-speed train. Along the train, you always see the homeless people's homes that they build. You down there? I don't know if you've seen that, you've gone to Europe on those high-speed trains. So this is going to high-speed train in China. This is the kind of homes you'd see next to the train. This is how the, the peasants live in their, where they farm is right next to their homes. So there is no like traditional like old-fashioned peasant homes that we kind of associate with China. They've basically all been replaced by these kinds of houses. It's upside down. These are more uh, little peasant towns we went by in China. That's how the people live there. And this was uh, Kunming, the same city we were walking around. All this. This is not really a tourist spot, it's just a place, a neighborhood. But you see all these lights right here. They all, they, they change color. What is this? This thing is not doing it in order. Uh. Okay. I'll go back to here. This is a, uh, Everything you want to buy in something in China, you use your phone. If you know these things, you ever use them here? Use what? These things. You want to buy something in a store, you on your phone to one of those, and that's how you pay. But you have to have money. What? You have to have money to pay. Yeah, you. there's no credit cards. Just imagine, it's like, if you don't have money in your account, you cannot buy it. Imagine what happened in the United States if they say, okay, no more credit cards. If you do not have the money in your account, you cannot buy anything. I mean, this country would just shut down, right? With what, credit card debt's like a trillion, over a trillion dollars. You can't use credit cards in China? I couldn't, no. Well, it depends if you got an on online account or not. They, they definitely have a... I tried using credit card and the guy just said, you know, it's either cash or... You put, you put, you put money on your phone with a credit card. Hmm? You put it on your phone with a credit card. I don't know. I tried to get 
to get a Yangtze River cruise and use a credit card, and I couldn't. But even all these too, it's like you go in the city and you want to get the uh, map of the city subway system, they have a, something like this. You click on it on your phone and you get the subway system on your phone. Or you go in a museum, you want to get all the tourist information from the museum, you just use one of these. They're all over the place, everywhere. It's like a lot more advanced than this country is now. Well, it's too bad not all of these are right here, but these were all these lights would all be changing colors. They had a lot of like, things like that in China where at nighttime they would have light systems all over. This is that city Kunming up on a mountain next to the city overlooking the city. That's what it looks like. It's in the southwest of China near Laos, Cambodia, uh, Laos, Vietnam, and uh, Myanmar, Burma. They did have uh, a bombing in the train station there by, you know, I guess, is Islamic terrorists, as they're called. So there was a little more police around there than I saw in other places. This is also this well, city. When did that happen? It's like 2014, 2015, killed about 30 people. I only, we got stopped by the police once. They wanted to know. We were on a bus, but everybody was Chinese except for us, so they, we got out, they asked us who we were, and they asked my wife where she's from, and she said, the United States, and how do you know Chinese? And she said, I learned it. And they said, okay. Um, This is, you can take a cable car down here up to the top of the mountain and it goes over the water right into the city. Now this I thought was interesting. Right here, that, that building right there, that's a police station. So I don't know how many police stations you see, like it tells you the relation of the police to the people compared to the relation to the police to the people in Chicago. Open door, you can walk right in. The, the, the windows are open. You can see through the windows, they're just glass windows. Chicago police can't do that. Can't see, you can't see in. Why do you need to know what <laughs> I, mean, I, I saw several, a couple of police stations like that. It's just like open. You just walk right into the police station. Here are some more of these uh, buildings that they're building these new buildings all over the country now for the people. This is more greenhouses I saw out in the countryside. This is another little town with their farm plots outside the town. So that's how the peasants live there now. These are more modern housing that they're building. Now, now I'm also in. I should say that uh, even all that is so modern, what you've seen, there's still a lot of the population there that are really, really country people that are just don't know how to, modern things, they don't know how to work. It's like we're on that subway and that Kung Ming, they, they had a little notice kept on going over and over. Like, when you get on the train, make sure you don't leave, you stick your hand in the door, don't spit on the floor, don't leave food in the train, um, don't stand up while the train is moving. It's the kind of thing I thought, well, this is what I tell my three-year-old granddaughter. When you're doing this, be careful, you close the door, don't stick your finger in the door. Stuff like that. It's like they're, these people, it's all completely new to them. That's I remember even one young guy, he was on the subway and he was he was holding on to the pole like this. Because he was like, so, I guess he'd never been on anything under yeah. his feet that was moving. And so he was just like. That's how it was in Russia. Huh? How it was in Russia, when we were in Russia. Oh. Exactly the same. You know, like yeah, when he got out of the train, he, he walked like on his hands and knees to get out of the train. And then when he got out of the train, then he stood up. It's interesting that 
even though it looks so modern, they still have a, a large percentage of the population that are really country people. And just all these things are just new to them. And this is in a tourist place called uh, Dali. That's it's a pretty big tourist place. It's like a they've maintained this old Chinese kind of town the way it used to look, and it's a big tourist attraction. But like all the tourists, I were there were Chinese. Out when I left outside of Shanghai, maybe I saw twenty-five or thirty Western tourists. All the other tourists that uh, were around, they were all Chinese tourists, which means they got, well, it's like, if I get to it later, I think China now has the biggest middle class of any country in the world, and it's 350 million people. So there's a big tourist market for Chinese. Um, and this is, this is up, up towards that mountain, looking down on the city. And, uh, Dali. This is a city looking up at the mountains. This is uh, this is the next city we went to. It's called uh, Li Jian, which is another old. It's part of a bigger city, but this they preserve this old part of uh, the city that there's no cars and no vehicles are allowed in it. It's all foot traffic and. This is just one of the little streets they have there. And you see this person here. They have people cleaning everywhere all the time. It's not that you don't see garbage. Yeah, every morning you get up, there's a, you go out early in the morning, you see people cleaning the streets and emptying the garbage. They knew that everywhere I went in China. They, they spend a lot of money and they have a, a lot of people working just keeping everything clean not something like here. Plus, I must say, in all the subway stations I went to, they had bathrooms, which means <laughs> you can go and you can take the subway wherever you want in China. It doesn't smell like pee anywhere, which is, you can't do that in the United States. They're all free public bathrooms that they have someone usually working in them as a job keep it clean. <coughs> now this is that old traditional city where we stayed for a couple days. Are you ready? This is more of the city walking around the city. It's, this is more of it what it looks like. They have a lot of tourists there. Uh, we went early in the morning. This is a public bathroom. There should be another one before. This is what their public bathrooms look like. Which for me, it's like if I go into a pretty fancy hotel, the bathroom would look like that. But this is just a free public bathroom. This is more of this town. And more, the whole town looks like this. They have a lot of tourists there. There's more people who are up early in the morning cleaning. This is early in the morning. It's middle of the day, these streets would be packed with people. These are some that went to a school later in the morning. These are some of the students in the school. And this was the school they were in. They let us walk in, look in the classrooms. Which, uh, I was thinking, well, you certainly can't just walk into the school in the United States and look in the classroom. <laughs> it was uh, just open. This was the entrance to the local high school. That's what that looks like. A little, a little different from the United States high school. This was one of the streets just outside the old-fashioned area. It's a pretty. It looks like a North Shore maybe. Huh? Wow, this was. Uh, I took this picture because. This lady was selling little things for like 50 or 60 cents in this bucket. Some old grandma, she would make them at home and then she'd bring this bucket and be in the tourist area and sell them out of her bucket. But even she used one of these little box things to pay. You want to pay you with your phone. 
I was kind of surprised. Even these old grandmas use these things. Now this was, this was also how these, both of these towns were like ethnic minority. This is the ethnic minority in that town. They're having some dance in the square that the people are all in the background, they're dancing. But it's not like ethnic minorities here where they're, they're clearly oppressed. They're, they're just, I mean, they look like the other people. I can't tell any difference between them. But they, they try to ensure their, their customs and make sure they maintain their local customs. And that's how they dress, those people. <coughs> this, this was the same town. This was an underground uh, mall. This is all new. This is all things they built in the last couple of years. There's been a lot of malls there too, like this. It's all brand new and clean. And this, this was interesting. This, you show, this is a, from a public bathroom. This tells you which toilets are open and which are occupied. Can you imagine? When would the United States ever get something like that? Yeah, that's really something. Yeah, I know. It's like, wow, this is. It's like, yeah, I, I think I live in a third world country compared to uh, when I go to when I went to China. Then I start taking pictures of this stuff. It's like, wow, I was really surprised. This is a thing. If your battery in your phone goes low. They have a thing where you just uh, pay and uh, you borrow a battery for, and you can stick your battery in there and charge your phone. And you click on that thing to pay a little amount of money. They have those on different public areas. They had a lot of these little service things, like, you know, public bathrooms that are clean, the people that clean the streets, little service like that, you know, that maybe back when I was real young, they had these kind of things in the Canada and the United States, but now, Can you have a box, no. please? They spend a lot of money into maintaining these these services for people to make their lives uh, a little simpler. That's another one of those. You can stick your, your battery in there. This is a train, the high-speed train. They have uh, 18,000 miles of high-speed trains in China now. And I think by 2020, they're going to have 20,000 miles. And by 2022 or 23, they're going to have 25,000 miles of high-speed trains. If they go, you know, 200, more than 200 miles an hour. This is just over farmland. I think I am on a high-speed train taking a picture of that other high-speed train line. And they have to make them so they're all perfectly smooth, perfectly flat, even when they go through mountain ranges. And this is countryside. You can see the country, little country town in the background and their fields in the foreground. This is more another town that looks like that. And if I if I blew up the pictures more, you look at all the housing, you can see well, it doesn't look like anybody is particularly poor. And I did read that since 1979, so now China has raised 850 million people out of poverty. And that, since 1979 to now, I think 70% of the people who have been risen out of poverty around the world are from China. And they're trying to eliminate poverty in China by 2020. Which I think they have about 40 million more that they consider <coughs> poor, which means I think about making a dollar 90 or less a day. Doesn't seem like you can do that, but 
you know, American dollar in China buys a lot more than dollar ninety would buy here. Dollar ninety there, I could buy a, a meal. This is another uh, town and countryside there. These are more modern cities in the city. Another train line right there in the foreground. It looks like a modern. This is uh, just a park outside of old people home, their senior home, I'll say. You'd be politically correct. Senior home. So. That's my wife. Hmm? That's my wife. Oh, that's my wife. So, I mean, they have a, it's not like a dumpy old home, a senior home. It's a, they keep a nice garden and everything, and a nice, they can walk by the, the river and so on. Uh, yeah. Everywhere they have flat land in China, they have farms. In Western China, it's a lot of mountains. Now, this is a train. This is one of the high-speed trains. That's what they look like on the inside. And I must say, you can tell that a lot of these people are country people because when you buy a train ticket, you get a seat. Like seat 2A or 2B or 2C. It's not like you don't have a seat, so you got to get in and get your seat. Or someone else does, well, you don't get a seat. But it's, it's, it doesn't matter. These people are all, they open the door, they all start pushing in like they're fighting over the seats. It's like, what? Everybody has an assigned seat, but they just do it all the time. It's just like this old, all this stuff, I guess, is so new and so recent that this old mentality hasn't kept up. It's like you can tell them, you have an assigned seat. You don't have to worry about not having a seat. It doesn't matter. You know, this is one of the, this is Chongqing, which is uh, right there. It's a city of like 28 million. This is a subway station, uh, the train station coming in. A huge train station. I think they have three train stations. You see, all, I mean, almost all the train stations, they look like this. It's all pretty modern. Very modern. This is the Buddhist temple inside the uh, Chongqing downtown. And you can see in this picture, too, you want to make a donation to the temple. You use your phone and you right there and you make a donation. Don't use money. You just use everything is on your phone. And everybody there has a phone. This is a downtown square in Chongqing. They have a lot of... Beijing, they have more of these. I mean, they have some that are the size. The whole side of the building is a, is a TV screen. You see, all this is very clean and it's very modern. You see, the people don't look uh, don't look at anything like the Chinese looked when I was young. This is more the downtown there. <clears throat> Looks like any modern fancy city. And I have to say, I it's two and a half. Three and a half weeks there, I saw probably two people that I would consider homeless, based on how homeless people look in the United States. I mean, they dirty clothes, didn't look, didn't take a bath, didn't look like they had some place to sleep. They were in a park. I saw two people like that in Shanghai. That was that was all I saw. This is uh, these cities. This is Chongqing. They, it lights up at night like that. I took a bunch of pictures how the city lights up at night. And even these lights here, there. If I had to show videos, the lights on these buildings all change color. So there's not just one color. Well, that one just shows it's changing color. This is. This is a quite Yangtze River. You're going on a, that's a cruise boat around the city. And the lights on that boat change color, you can see. Uh, there it is. 
this is part of this tourist part there in Chongqing. All Chinese tourists. That's more in the city of Chongqing, how it is lit up at nighttime. That's more of that city. That's, you know, I don't know, 15, 20 stories high in that building right here. I can't really tell from the picture. This is a monument that was built in the late 40s to the national heroes of China, before the communists took over in 1949. Oh, these are just some political slogans that I, I took to get translated, but I forgot to bring the translation. But they don't really say that much. Put them somewhere. This is uh, like the old part of uh, Chongqing, like a tourist place for uh, what Chongqing used to look like. It's a big tourist trade. See, there <laughs> we got there in the morning early, and that's what it looked like in the afternoon. All those people. <laughs> it's like thousands and thousands of people there. And that's the Chongqing, the city, the, one of the bridges going out of the city. There, all that stuff lights up. Then I was taking a Yangtze River cruise, and I just were just leaving to go on the cruise on a boat. <clears throat> I went on a boat that was, I was the only person who was not Chinese on the boat. Nobody on the boat spoke English, or if they did, they didn't talk to me. Which is a lot cheaper. <laughs> if I got on a boat where they had people that spoke English, you'd pay at least double. <clears throat> now this was one of the places we stopped to on the cruise. That's guy. Who, I just took that picture because it, that's his uh, baby carriage thing. You see, it's just a. Uh, I guess a bucket. He's standing up in that bucket, that baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Never seen that before. And this is, this was early in the morning, they are all uh, dancing. Chinese always go to the parks in the morning and dance, or do Tai Chi or something. Tai Chi. Tai Chi. Yeah. Tai Chi. Energy. This was, Energy. Yeah. this was one of the cities, I've never even heard of the city, I don't remember the name of it. Even that some city I never even heard of. Was that rebuilt? Rebuilt or is that new? Yeah, that's all new. It's all, it's all new stuff. Yeah, they, it's like everything is new. It's kind of amazing. This is another city we went by on the Yangtze River cruise. Went by it at night. It's all lit up like that. And even I mean, those things there would be changing colors. Do you do they do salaries? Hmm. Do they work for salaries or yeah. does everything, does the Chinese government pay for everything? I think most people work, uh, well, considering all the, the peasants are going to work for themselves, I don't know, I think it's like 20% of the population work for the government, in the government or something. 80% are work private. And I think, uh, I think I wrote it down later in that PowerPoint thing, but I think their, uh, their wage has gone up five times in the last, <laughs> since the 1990s. They, their wages go up about 10% a year in China. Which I guess is why, you know, the middle class is like 850 million and why they basically getting rid of poverty. I mean, actually, you know, the population in China is almost 1.4 billion people, and the number of people that are poor, well, I don't know what, it's 40 million that have no insurance here, but it's 40 million people that are still considered poor, below poverty line in China. This is another city that we went by. 
I mean, so it's not just the modern show cities where tourists go that look like this. This is like, all the cities we saw look like this. This is still going on the cruise, going by different cities. So this is this is one bridge where I took pictures of a... Uh, <laughs> pictures of this different colors on the on this bridge but I don't know where the other ones went. Mm -hmm. This is along the Yangtze River what it looks like if you went on the Yangtze River cruise. These were uh, people we ate with for the three days we were on the boat. We had ten people at that little table. <coughs> That's our breakfast. Was it soy milk? And those are soybeans. I forget what other stuff there. But that's their other breakfast bowl. None of them spoke English. But I could talk to them a little to my wife. They asked me what I what I thought of China compared to the United States. And this guy was saying, well, the United States is a war country. We are not a war country. He says, yeah, I said, I think, you know, the United States is, uh, would like to go to war with China. And he said, yeah, we know that. The United States cannot go to war with China. It's too late. They can't do anything now. Just like their sanctions, their tariffs, it's too late. Did you know the stock market's gone down like 2,000 points in the last, what, three weeks? <laughs> Trump's and tariffs, it's like, you got to tell them, hey, you know, you're hurting us more than you're hurting China by doing this. This is along the Yangtze River, the three, the three, uh, three something gorge. What's three gorges down. Three, three, three gorges down, okay, but this is not, this is the three gorges. Yeah. What it looks like. just along the river. There in the background they're building a high speed train which it has to go if it's going to go high speed it has to go it has to be perfectly flat. It can't go up and down. So they they gotta go through bridges and go through mountains and make it all perfectly flat. I think they spend like 90 or to or 100 billion dollars a year building high-speed train systems around the country for the last several years. This is a log and this is a walkway. They built a walkway in case you wanted to walk the train. Now this was, this would be the fancy boat. If you were a tourist, a western tourist, you'd go on that boat. We went on this boat here. Which was $300, I think, $340 for three days, including everything. That's more of the Yangtze River looks like. It's really smooth. Didn't see any waves on the river. I think that's getting towards the end of it. This was an old train, <coughs> old-fashioned train. So we took like a, a five-hour train ride, and I guess it went, I don't know, speed of a U.S. train, 40 miles an hour or so, but it cost like $6 to go for five hours. These, these were all real country people. They'd be also be the ones who would all like crush each other to get in to get their seat, like it wasn't reserved. It was so did you have a seat? You yeah, a I didn't see. Everybody seat? had a seat. If you didn't have a seat, you couldn't get on the train. You had to buy a ticket and they, you got a seat when you bought your ticket. And it's marked on the ticket. It's just, I guess, 
Oh, it must be like people who grew up in the 30s in the United States when they go through the Great Depression. Even when they go get older, they save stuff just because of that experience, and they can't say, uh, you know, grow out. Of it. I mean, they used to, these people used to be really, really poor. This is an old uh, country house in the country, what the peasants live in now. You can see a lot of them had uh, solar panels on their roofs. This is a whole field of solar panels. This is another home just in the country going by it in the train. These are just country people's homes, not any kind of anybody I would think had any particular amount of money. I mean, it looks like uh, some western town, right? <coughs> this is kind of my idea of what countryside in China was like, but that's this is what countryside in China looks like now. And then this was this big national park. Hmm? I think they're getting rid of that one child policy now. They're making more exceptions for it. They've had it off for a while. Uh, this I'm going to is this Jane Jaji National Park, which is a huge national park. It's all it's all sandstone, and I guess it used to be a river, and they carved on the top. Is it look? It's like the uh, going to Grand Canyon, where you go along. It's flat, and then you get to the Grand Canyon, and just goes down a couple thousand feet. Except this, they have stuff sticking up inside. But it's also huge. This is uh, this is uh, 15 times the size of the city of Chicago. This park, in terms of square miles. They showed made some movie here. I don't know what the movie is. But you know, you can look down like down there. It's like a, a couple thousand feet, I think. Well, they do have a place called Shaving the Lock. We were down in the bottom right here. You can see how high up it goes. There's an enormous park like that. I like this. With all these big fight in the United States, States over unisex toilets. See, they have like unisex toilet there. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> These were some old uh, country people going to the park. I noticed all of these people were wearing Mao buttons. I noticed a lot of people around there were wearing Mao buttons. I wish I said, ask why is everybody wearing a Mao button? They said, well, Mao was born right near here in Hunan. And it's home. I guess they're going on a tour and they go to his home and then they go to the park and you go to his home and you get a Mao button. But I'm used to seeing, uh, you know, some U.S. people wearing Mao buttons and they're usually kind of wacky. But it's interesting to see all these old middle-aged ladies wearing Mao buttons. This was a in the park. I guess this is like these pictures is like you look at. Do you see a guy standing up or do you see a woman sideways? You know those kind of pictures. How you look at it, you see two different things. Something like that. Well, if you're a woman, you look at it and you see the heart. If you're a guy, you look at it and you see the lock. <laughs> This is up in the park. We we stayed in the town way down here, which is a couple thousand feet down. This is all in the same park. It's a huge place. Yeah, that's the house. Oh, this is more of the park. I guess you can't really tell how these things are like a thousand feet high sticking up from the floor. You can tell from that one a little bit. 
but I can't even get the whole thing in the picture. That's like a near more modern buildings. That's an old fashioned train right here. Their high speed trains look like the kind of ones you'd see in Europe. And I, it, this was a car, to buy a car. I forget where I saw that. But this is what you'd pay a month. To buy a car after you put down payment, what you pay a month, that's 120 RMB, which is like $18 a month. You know what? Huh? 18? Yeah, and 176, that's like $25 a month. So that's what they'd pay. If you bought a car, that would be your monthly car. And this is, uh, <coughs> I forget what city, oh, this was in Guaylin. We, after we, we came back from Guaylin and we flew from Guaylin, which is uh, down here, all the way over to Shanghai, which is over there. It's like a two hour flight. I guess it's like going to Chicago to New York. It was like $71. Well, that was one way. So I said I had. Uh, I bought the ticket and I realized I made it a day early, so I had to change it. So I bought them up and I was trying to see if I'll get out of paying a change fee and whatever, and if they give me a break. So I just asked them, like, how much does it cost to change it, or if I could just keep my old ticket? They said, well, to change the change a ticket, it costs $15. That's it. Just $15 to change your flight ticket. Mm -hmm. Not like uh, here, You're basically buying a lot of ticket. This was, I'm not sure why this is here. This is, <coughs> I saw this in a, in a, this old part of Chongqing. What did I say? You know, this is a Maoist thing, right? Yeah, uh, right. Uh, the student, the worker, and the soldier unite. Right, so it should be. But they put something in, under it that has like just makes fun of this picture. It says, "Hold high the cucumber for and march towards happiness or something." That's what it says. But it's interesting that you know now somebody can put that up in their store and it's like that's okay. <laughs> I showed that to some Chinese guy here. He said, you must have seen that inside the store. They would, You couldn't have put that out in the street. I said, yeah, it was in the store. Libertarian books. A restaurant. This was a, a farm with all the, they cover all the plants. I mean, not a farm, it's a, oranges, I think. This is in Guaylin. That's what Guaylin looks like if you go there. Flat and it has these little mountains sticking up like that, like little pyramids all over. This one doesn't. Oh. This was kind of. I can't make these bigger. Oh, I can. This is to go rock climbing. And if you look Whoa. up close, you get to see. <laughs> Like a guy climbed up there and stuck all these stuffed animals up. Those are all stuffed animals. Up. What's the name? Stuffed bears up there. What's the, up name of the, what's the name of this mountain? Oh, I don't know. This is just in Guaylin. I mean, it's hundreds of mountains there like this. What's the name of this city? Guaylin. Guaylin? Guaylin uh, down there, number six. This is a Guaylin, it's a farm, and on the mountains in the background. There's more farmer housing, there's more modern city housing. Uh, this was in Wan Shan, which is another, I mean, I went, I went to tourist places. Guaylin is a tourist place. Zhang Zhejing is a tourist place. Dali and Li Jian are tourist places. Quan Show is a tourist place. And the Quan Shan is a tourist place. 
this was a huge mountainous area. So you go up there and you can see what, how far down the town is, way down there. It's like maybe it's the biggest mountain in, in China outside of where in, in Tibet. This is back in the very beginning. more from the mountain looking down. Oh, this is just a sign of it. But this is uh, Nan Nanjing Road in um, Shanghai. Early in the morning. This is like, uh, this is a walk. No cars are allowed in it. This is, must be like Michigan Avenue, North Michigan Avenue. If you didn't allow cars in it, it was just a walk area. This is downtown? Yeah, this is right in the middle of downtown Shanghai. This is where I would see uh, white people. Then you would see McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken and everything. This is all downtown Shanghai and that, that street. Early in the morning, this is the Bund. Have you heard of the Bund in Shanghai? Well, the Europeans own this part of Shanghai, and you, if you're Chinese, you're not allowed into it. Huh? No, well, this is 1949 that ended. Before the revolution, yeah, this was this exclusive zone for the white people. This was, uh, I didn't ever take any pictures of highways, but this is what their highways look like. They look like modern, fancy highways. Everything there looks modern. I, could, I wasn't really going to take pictures of China, but after I was there two days, I was like, wow, this country looks more modern than the United States. And they're, they get more modern every year. Oh, here's, this is, I don't know how this got in its order. This is a mausoleum to um, Sun Yat-sen, went to in the very beginning in Nanjing. And, uh, this is Stone Forest, which I can make. This is in Shanghai? I don't know why some of these get out of order. They were in order when my thumb drives. But these stones are huge because that's a person right there. That little red dot? It blow it up. It's what I see, but the whole area just looks like that. Well, there you see me and, uh, next to some wow. other ones. Oh, here's the other one. <laughs> now, here's a bathroom. I took a picture of See, they always have people working in them. That's <laughs> popular. Interesting. Very <laughs> popular. I don't know the last time I ever saw a public bathroom in the United States. But you don't see people working in them. We're even the airport. But these are just on the street. They have public bathrooms on the street. Wow. It'd be like walking down Michigan Avenue and there's a public bathroom area. And it looks like this. And people work in it and keep it clean. It's for free? It's free? Yeah, it's free. Wow. <laughs> Like unheard of here, huh? Yeah. <laughs> There's a Nanjing Road again. I don't know what ha this is. Chunky Meadow. I don't know why these pictures got out of order. This is some place on uh, Yangtze River cruise where we got off the boat in these farmers were bringing in uh, food to the market to sell, so I, he, this is, there's one in the front and one in the back, he weighed a couple hundred pounds, and he walked up a big flight of stairs from the water to the, to the park to sell all these, this guy, he must have been about 50 pounds less than I was, well now I'm getting, these are got out of order. When we went up this mountain that was like 6,000 feet high, the whole way up the mountain, 
was like this, with stone walkway, like that, 6,000 feet. And there was hotels on top of it. And people carried it all the way up. The hotels, people carried food. For the workers, they didn't have any way to transport the food. They had to pay people to bring the, haul the food up on their backs or with these things over their shoulders. And these things, these stones would weigh a ton. You think that they carried all this up the mountain to make this walkway that went all the way up the mountain. There is more of what it looks like walking up. You have to go way up there <laughs> is the top of the mountain. It took us, I don't know, four hours to walk up there. You think these guys walked up with like a couple hundred pounds that's what they're, that's their job every day. Ah, I don't know. I guess that's it. Yep. Did you saw Great China's wall? Great China wall. I don't want a camera. Um, is that an, is that an hour? Chinese wall. You know, wall. Did I go to the wall? You like, Sam? What? Did you got, Ileana, why don't you wait till they ask questions? Now the wall's up north. I didn't go to. I've been to Beijing twice. Okay, well then I can go with about what some of the stuff I was going to talk about. The PowerPoint, you mean? Yeah. Click on the P down there on the bottom. The PowerPoint's on the bottom. See where the power? Go, go to where the P's on the bottom. To the right, the to orange. The right. orange. Oh. Okay, now start. Go to go to from beginning at the top left hand corner. Okay. Go to from beginning at the top left hand yeah. corner. That's right here. No, up up a little. The next one, right there. Click. Okay. And just advance. Uh, advance it using a space bar. You know, they, you know, trying to have their century of humiliation, which they're talking about now. It's like, we're not going back there. Trump wants us to make us go back there. We're not going back there. Yeah. And this all started with the British, but they're pushing opium on the China. Because the British were buying silk and tea and uh, China from China, and China wasn't importing anything from Britain. They were just taking all the Britain, not taking it, but... They were selling it for silver, so Britain figured, well, we need to get some way to get money out of China. So they started the Opium War, which I don't know, I, uh, it's kind of amazing how much opium. I mean, they were like, Britain would be basically like, if Colombia, you know, they're sell or Afghan, I do two ones selling all that opium. Drugs, the United States now are the number one U.S. ally in Latin America, which is Colombia, and the one that U.S. is occupying in the Middle East, Afghanistan. That's where all the drugs coming here come from, from U.S. allies. Um, but it, Britain started exporting opium. They made the Indians in India uh, grow opium. Started in 1730, it was, it was 15 tons of opium they exported to China. Then in, by 1773, it was 75 tons. Between 1800 and 1820, it was 315 tons a year. In 1820, there was 700 tons of opium a year. But then in 1839, that's when China said, okay, then you're not doing this anymore. It had been 2,800 tons of opium, 2 million addicts, a total Chinese population of 350 million. It means one of every 16 people in China was addicted to opium. So Chinese just took all the opium out and dumped it in the water and said, we don't want to get your opium out of here, sort of like they did with the uh, Boston Tea Party. So then, but then Britain attacked the country and defeated it in the opium wars. <coughs> then the opium export, the British went from, uh, from
4,108 tons of opium in 1860 to 7,386 tons of opium that Britain exported forced on the China by 1880. I don't know how many people here know, I mean, Chinese know this, we don't know this, but they're like, Chinese, like, we're not going back to this again. You're not, that Trump is, uh, he can forget about trying to make us bend down to it like we, you did back in the last century. So to compare this, it's like Britain exported 7,300 or 400 tons of opium in 1880. Right now, the total production is 10,500 tons. That's today how much opium is produced. So you can see how much how heavily involved Britain was in drug smuggling, or, or was smuggling there. It was government policy. Now about uh, poverty reduction. <laughs> I think I said this. this yeah. first part. And it's not, I mean, this is a, a, a government program. In, in 2016, they sent 775,000 officials out to the villages around the, the country to work on eliminating poverty. It's a serious government program. You know, people who say China's capitalist, well, I don't think capitalist governments do that kind of thing. After the wages, you asked me about the wages. I said uh, Chinese wages are five times what they were in the middle 1990s. From 2009 to 2017, the wages doubled, and they grow by like 10 per, nine, 10 percent a year. So that era when they had sweatshops has kind of uh, been gone by now. I mean, the stereotype of the burn of it. And I should say that when China let in all these Western corporations to set up business in China, they said as a condition, you have to teach us how to do this stuff. You can't just, like the U.S. does when they open a factory somewhere in, I don't know, Mexico. They don't teach the Mexicans how to do it themselves. They keep it. It's called whatever they call it. Technology transfer. Yeah, or they call it the intellectual, what is Capital. it called? Capital. I, I, I did intellectual property. Yeah, intellectual property. They're trying to say, you want, you want to have your stuff here, you have to give us, tell us how to do this stuff. And these Western companies agreed to it. Of course, back in the 1990s, China wasn't considered a threat. But no, now they're like, uh oh, China's ahead of us. So in China, the economic growth from 1900 to 37, it grew 3%, period, not per year, period. For 37 years, the economy grew just 3%, which means, like, I don't know, 0.1%, not even one tenth of a percent a year. From 53 to 78, it grew 4.4 percent a year. The economy. The U.S. that period grew 3.6 percent, and that was even during the cultural, so-called cultural revolution and the Great Leap Forward, which kind of destroyed the economic system. <coughs> Chinese economy is now 50 times larger than it was in 1978. The economy has doubled in size since 2008. And it is still like that. From 18, 1980 to 84, that's when Deng Xiaoping started these opening to the West. It grew 10% a year. Between 1993 and now, it's grown between 6% and 15%. And I know they always say the you know, Chinese economy is slowing down and they're going into economic crisis. They're growing right now at 6.4%. And the U.S. is growing at 2.7 percent, but they say China is slowing down. They don't have freedom of speech, right? Oh, they, yeah, they don't have, yeah, they say that too. I didn't notice any lack of freedom of speech though there. Um, 
So the GDP has <coughs> doubled since 2008. The economic outlook for the world this year, it's 3.3%. Uh, for China, it's 6.3%. For the US, it's 2.3%. And the Eurozone is 1.3% growth. So whatever they say about China economy slowing down, it's not. I like this one. It says, measured in dollars, Chinese economy was the same size as Britain's in 2005. By 2009, it was double the size of Britain's economy. By 2012, it was three times the size of Britain's economy. By 2016, it was four times the size of Britain's economy. So that means in every three or four years, China adds the equivalent of the entire British economy to its own economic strength. And that's continuing. I don't know what the U.S. has got a problem. When the U.S., when the dollar no longer becomes the world currency, that's like this country is uh, basically. Their output has, have I gone over an hour yet? Yeah, you have. It's about... Uh, 7.30, 7 and we want to get right, to, let me see if I get, to, get, get your questions. really easy. important. Oh, maybe this is, because I never knew this. And I'll stop. Central planners in China control just 600 commodities and the prices of a few thousand compared to the Soviet Union which controlled 60,000 commodities and millions of prices. Just one Chinese account economic system is not centrally controlled like the Soviet Union's was. In 79, the Soviet Union had 40,000 state-run factories. China, in that same year, before they started their opening, they had 883,000. 800,000 were controlled by city and local governments. So the Chinese economy was always more decentralized, which I think they had done that under the Mao period in case that they were invaded. It was, things were set up to withstand an invasion. If some part of the country got lost to some foreign invasion, they still had the, the other parts of the country operating kind of independently. Oh, I was going to go in, and I could go into some of that later. All right, I'll stop, I guess. I was going to go into how they are moving towards solar and uh, wind energy a lot, which they are, but still their output of um, carbon gases is still went up 4.7% last year. United States, it went up, I think, 2.7 percent. So it's still going up. And all this stuff about global warming, global carbon emissions is still going up at a pretty rapid rate. I, I yeah. guess on this, that they have 1949, 8.6 percent of the country was forest, and now it's 21.6. Six percent. It's okay, I guess. Okay. I don't want to go on forever. All right, let's thank Stan for his uh, presentation. Oh, right. yeah. Andy, can you get up there and give a count of the rebuttals, please? You, you took our money and then you went to All right, how many people want to? I'm sorry, let's get into questions and answers. Do you self moderate or do you need a moderator for Just questions? Oh, you want? Oh, sure. I can do that. Okay. I can self-moderate. The first, the first one would be me. Did, did you do any? Not self but okay. Did you do any driving in China, or at least get on some of the uh, interstate highways that they have? I took buses. How was uh, traffic in a lot of those cities? I didn't really see very much traffic. I just in Shanghai, uh, some places I did. But I really didn't, I was kind of surprised that I didn't see much. Of course, they have such an excellent subway and rail system. 
you don't really need it. It's so cheap that you don't really need a car. Who's next? There's a couple things you left out over here. First of all, we're talking about uh, something they got right now, facial recognition. Uh, cameras, uh, many cities have that in there. Increasing this tenfold as we speak. They can track you by facial recognition from your house to the train station to your department stores to your park and everything. And then one more question. You mentioned about the minorities, how well they treat them over there. What about the Tibetans? I mean, these are people in their own country. How do they treat them? I mean, we, we leave these things out. We're, we're painting too much of a rosy picture here. We gotta be aware of these issues. I didn't understand your first question. So, the question was, first one was about the facial recognition. They got cameras that are building more and more all over the place. They're, they're gonna have, well you, you can track everybody in the country from your, from by, by, by camera recognition. They, they, could, they could track you to the train stations, where you're at, anywhere. If look, the police are looking for you, they can find you all over the place. Yeah. And th that's something you leave, we're leaving out. That's a very big brother. Yeah, you that out. Well, I mean, Honestly, they have the same thing here. Where? They're they, talking about putting well, in San Francisco. Everywhere you go is on, you know, you got a phone. They know where you are all the time. The National Security Agency has got your phone. It's got all your info. They want to know where you are. They know where you are. Well, Facebook shares this with them. So it's like, uh, and I think some of that, I don't know if that's all over I think that's in uh, Xinjiang, I think, They're building which it. is where the U.S. and, uh, you know, they had so-called terrorist groups and terrorists, so-called Muslim terrorists, but I, mean, that's, that's, I guess that's yeah. better than having a war. I mean, it's also like the U.S. is involved in that, too. <laughs> Just like the U.S. was involved with, like, uh, the, uh, Bin Laden. They came back and blew up the Twin Towers. I, I can't, I'm not going to say everything about his race. I'll just say what I saw. Okay. Right. Sorry. Uh, is, um, did, the whole time you were there, did you learn anything at all about the Fulan Gong? Um, yeah, I know my, a little about them anyways. But they are basically uh, funded from Taiwan to try to... The U.S. is, is, is trying to provoke China, right? And they use various groups. They use Muslim terrorist groups. They use the Fulong Gong. I mean, there's a connection. I don't know if you know, but I mean, I, don't, I didn't bring the information here, but yeah, they are connected with uh, the U.S. and Taiwan, financed by them. But I didn't see any of them there. I think after some of them, uh, what, some mother and her burned herself and her daughter in Tiananmen Square, then they really cracked down and said, you know, not allowed to do this kind of stuff. You go burn your kid in Tenement Square. Okay. Yes, in uh, the late 40s and early 50s, it's my understanding that China had tribes of, of the old landlords. And it was at that time that the Chinese broke up the old estates. Is that how this was done? I can't hear you that well. I said, then in the late 40s and the early 50s, the Chinese put the old landlords on trial. Yeah. This was how they broke up the huge estates. Uh-huh. Was that how this was done? Yeah, that's how they did it. They killed a lot of them. What? That's what they yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was wondering you had uh, conversations with people, or you know, uh, if they're moving towards, away from a hybrid society, towards a social society. Is any talk of that? Any knowledge of it? Moving from a what society? They're, they're in a hybrid society now, a mixture of capitalism and socialism, moving towards socialism. Is there any talk 
of doing away with the capitalist part of it. Ah, uh, I've That's never true. heard anything. Yeah. No. They call it Chinese socialism with Chinese characteristics, yeah. which doesn't really mean anything. Um, it's kind of a, a euphemistic phrase for reintroducing some capitalism. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, question. Uh, you mentioned there are some places where the cars are not allowed. So I just wonder if cars are a problem, a pollution, etc., that kind of thing, with the car using cars? No, this is like if you go to some parts of Europe, there are some downtown areas of cities where cars are not allowed. And I think it's just like that. It's like special tourist areas, they don't have cars in, don't let cars in. That's yeah. what it was. These were these were tourist areas I went to. <laughs> oh, I don't know. They're not that poor anymore. I said they said our middle class is 350 million, and you can buy a car and you're paid 18 dollars a month. Well, that's not. You know what? What is, what is the average salary? Um, I didn't, I don't have that information. Thank you, honey. I know they have a lot of millionaires and a lot of billionaires. Yeah, I know. They have, they, I did read something that I think 10% uh, of the population owns 70% of the wealth. So it's, there's a lot of inequality. Yeah. Well, I don't know, maybe here it's worse. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, Charles. Yeah, uh, sir, your trip took you largely to, I noticed, the south, uh, southeast of China on main line, on the main line. But what about the furthest rural reaches of this nation? Do you think your view is perhaps maybe a little distorted regarding modernity? You telling me? But I mean, I, I took a train and I went through a lot of countryside. You said on right. the main line in Southeast China. What about if you got well, out by Kazakhstan? How's it look out there? <laughs> you don't well, really that's, know. That's that's, uh, I mean, I, I was just, what I'm getting at, I don't think the modernization has reached the rural areas. The indication there that they're sending people into something that sounds like a, a war in poverty is sending them to rural areas uh, for that purpose. Uh, I don't believe that modernization has been extended to the rest of the country. Well, all I can say is, I mean, if I had seen poor places, I would have... I'm not trying to give you a distorted picture, I just... <laughs> took pictures of what I saw. Yeah, I, went, I went from there to there on a train. And you go through a, on a train, I think anywhere in the world, you're going to go see everything. Did you get off the train in the rural areas? Were you able to get off at certain stops, or did you just drive, go for hundreds of miles? Well, all down here is a rural area. And around here is a rural area. What I meant was, did you just ride? And I guess so when that, near that mountain, to get to that mountain, you go through a rural area. Yeah. You stop and walk around and see the people in those areas. Yeah. Okay, that's all we were asking. But uh, I expected to see that, but I, I didn't. I don't. I mean, I've seen things on YouTube where I can see. Poor people in China. 
where I went and looked when I got home. But I didn't see that. And I don't know, they said, you know, the wealthy part of China is along here. And out here, it's not wealthy. It's poor area. Okay. Okay. Mom, go. Oh, you, you said they still have high carbon emissions? Yes. And, but are they yeah, in the Paris Accord? Yeah. And yeah. I thought I've heard they are trying to, to do something about their pollution. Um, but do you know uh, like, like exactly what can be done without <laughs> the industry? I mean, without, I, I don't know. That's what they say about it. Uh, well, let me go back to the, because uh, I didn't get into that. I think they have, I think like almost half the solar, solar panels and about half the wind power is in China. Okay. But it's, they, according to that th thing in the New York Times, they still, their emissions went up 4.7% last year. Of course. So do, do they have infrastructure? Do they have infrastructure? Of course. Is that why it's solar? Is that why what? They do not have the power line infrastructure. I don't know what that means. Why? It's this big country and it's called rural electrification. And they had to do a special project to bring electricity to rural areas in the United States. Have they done that in China? If well, not, I guess most of their I mean, the houses I showed you in the countryside, some of them, <coughs> fair, fair amount of them had solar panels on their roofs. Don't you, I, I got a statement. Don't you know of how big Three Gorges Dam was in power output alone? Don't you know how much that's going on with the building out of the electrical grid as well as the high-speed trains and everything else? <coughs> that, take, that takes a lot of infrastructure. Yeah. And if there's not... If you have a high-speed train running from like Beijing or whatever, you're going to have the infrastructure for electric power. Now, China is number one in renewable energy, yes, but they also have 900 plus people working actively in the development of thorium uh, on, on mini nuclear, the, the, the thorium stuff I'm talking about. They're the world leaders in it. They'll probably be the first ones to have a commercial reactor ready just so they can get out their coal power. Um, do you? Well, yeah, a lot of those things I don't know about. I mean, I know they, you get one-sided stories in the United States about China. I'm sourcing but, it from CCTV. Uh, I'm just trying to show you, like, and, even and though you, I know I get a one-sided story about China, when I went there, I was kind of surprised at how even I underestimated how right. far they'd gone. Mm -hmm. Like I remember I couldn't get a picture because the train was going too fast, but I saw four high-speed bri train bridges going like this next to each other and another one going over top. They had five right there and we were on another one going next to them all, so we were number six. Six of those lines right now, it was like those highway things you see in Los Angeles, except these are all high-speed train lines. Uh, yeah. Okay. You were talking about the um, the homes that passed. You were talking. You were talking about the the, the homes that you passed, the dwellings, the homes. So have they moved to private property ownership? Are those homes owned by the people who live in them, or is it still communal property, or or how is it? Or? I don't think they have. The land is land is nationalized. I had something written down about oh, 
I don't know where it is. Right here. Oh, right here. Oh, right here. There's only key parts of the economy that are in the control of the, uh, the government, the state. Banking, uh, basic industry, and everything else is uh, privatized. What I was saying is, in the past, a person couldn't own a home. Right. Has that changed? Oh yeah. Now it's like here, you got to get a mortgage and all that. You can sell your own home. I don't think you can sell the land. Do they have a public house like here? What? Rent? Rent? I, I guess so, but I don't, I don't know if you can rent or not. I would assume so. Uh, may I stand? Hmm? The, the real estate market in China is effectively privatized. One of the biggest problems they've been having is with all this modernization is the poor peasant farmer who owns land near the village. And a lot of times where there's been a lot of the big corruption cases have been the government using its eminent domain powers to appropriate that land and not compensating the poor peasant farmer for the actual value of the land. There's been, and then a lot of times the, the government seizes power and sells it to a private developer at a substantial profit. Now there are rents, there are other things, but there's been a lot more control in other words, what, now, what, what happened was China operated for eons under the, under the Confucius system for governance. The communism was just an, an anomaly that, that got out everything out of whack. They went to capitalism, they basically reintroduced a lot of the Confucius stuff that they've been using for over 3,000 years. That's why it's been so stable for most of the time. They've had wars and things like that, but Recently, you know, with the capitalism and some of the moderns, they emulated a lot of the United States in, in, in the early 50s, building a roads and infrastructure and trains. More interstate highways have been built there in the last 10 years than ever in the United States. Oh, in China? What yes, in China. From China what? What can we do from them? They do it here. Um, I noticed when you showed the pictures, you didn't see too much pollution in the air. Uh, 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 yeah, where I was, no. I mean, in industrial areas, you would see it. But I mean, I went to tourist areas, so obviously you're not going to see a lot of pollution. Now, if you go to national parks, you're not going to see it. I went to national parks. Well, you showed a lot of cities. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose in Chongqing you would see pollution. Yeah, give me one minute, okay? And uh, Shanghai and Nanjing. The rest of it I wouldn't see, but I. I mean, do I see pollution in Chicago? That's kind of. I mean, I know it's there, but do I see it? No. I'm not sure. You got one guy way in the back, Stan. Oh. Government there is the whole government run on a national level, or is there, or is there a bit more of provincial and municipal having control of parts of China? Well, according to what I read about the, the how they how centralized the economy is, it seems like a lot of the decision making is decentralized. But I don't know about. You're any more than that about your question, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how a national government would run a country with 1.3 billion people. I would think that would be. I don't okay. know. All right. Yeah. You're yeah. asking me a lot of questions that I don't know about. Are we ready to go to rebuttals? Or are you I want to. Okay. I don't want to say I'm not. Right. You, you're just, you traveled the country. You, you're reporting on what you observed, and you don't really have a lot of I mean, I knowledge. could have, but then I figured, well, yeah. I was surprised to see all this stuff, so maybe I should just show these pictures that I saw, because I was like, this doesn't... Okay. 
doesn't fit with my idea of what China is like. But I also didn't, I mean, you chose that picture of Mao. I'm not any big fan of Mao. I think after about 1957, everything Mao did just sent back to China a lot. And he just messed things up. Before 1957, yeah, it was basically good. After that, no. We should go back to China under the Republic? Pardon? We should go back to China under the Republic? That was before 49. I said, so you don't like 57. Mao, then you must like the Republic. I said, after 57, I don't right. think he did a very good job. 49, but 57, yeah, he did many things that benefited China a lot. Okay. Are we ready to go to rebuttals? Well, one, 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 one quick one. When all the cities that you visit, what do they have for public transportation outside of the high-speed rail train? Well, they have subway systems and almost all of them. Buses or just a lot of subways? Buses. I, I, it's kind of hard. I, didn't, I usually don't take... Do they have buses? Yeah. I just want but, to, you know, to go on a bus and the everything's Chinese. It's like, I, where do I get off? How do I know when to get off? <laughs> At least in the subway, they have English and Chinese. Yeah. But yeah, they have buses. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I know. Okay, let's thank Stan. All right. All right, if we're ready to go to rebuttals, Andy, could you help lead this part? Yeah. All right. We'll let Andy get a count of the rebuttals and how much time we have left. Can you turn off the projector by hitting the power button at the top? Right there, the big okay, round. Okay, have one. a show of hands. Way up top. One, right, two, three. Yeah, hit it twice. Jonathan, you going to say anything? Anybody over here? Five, six, seven. Okay, everybody gets 47 seconds. <laughs> a little humor there, maybe? No. Um, Very little. Three, three minutes. Three minutes tonight. We're you a sure? Late. But that's okay. From what I could see, China's made the tremendous strides. In fact, it's the most... Um, Progressive country that ever existed on the planet. I don't know what else to say about it. And the reason for that, because it's it's actually the, the leaders are actually socialists and communists, and that's the reason that it made so much progress. But it had to build on capitalism because it was a third world country. It was controlled by the imperialists like uh, England, the United States, France, and they pushed dope on it and tried to keep it back in, in, uh, in any progressive direction. Where, and there was a saying, it's, uh, China is a sleeping giant, and when it awakes, it'll shake the world. I think that's what actually happened. But it had, it had to use capitalism because it was such a backward country. And without using capitalism, it never would, would have succeeded. Now, Karl Marx thought that uh, socialism would come from a highly industrialized society. But he didn't see imperialism. He was not able to see it because it started to develop maybe in the early 1900s or so. Lenin wrote about that about imperialism and monopolies and things that had nature. So it was a very backward country. So if it didn't use capitalism, it would have, would have succeeded to the extent it does now. Now to go into socialism, it'll take a little while. And if we don't have a war, and if we don't destroy ourselves with global pollution, I think maybe probably in the next 50 years or so, it, it'll make real headway. Not only make real headway, but what it was trying to do right now is to show the people what socialism could do. And people will look at that example and see where their future is. They failed in the Soviet Union 
because they were surrounded by all capitalist countries and they tried to destroy this country as soon as it had its revolution it was constantly under attack there probably wasn't one year that it wasn't under attack that's probably one of the biggest reasons why it failed because it had to put so much money into armaments and the second world war destroyed the whole country also. and then they had to re rebuild after 1945 and still they were surrounded I think the United States had something like 250 bases around the Soviet Union a after after the uh, war the war in Europe uh, ended so it's always under attack so China is uh, not uh, building up its military that much because it realizes if it doesn't uh, help the people in the country to get better living conditions, it won't succeed. And that's one of the reasons why Russia didn't succeed, because the living standards are so low. Good evening, I'm David Travis. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I think our speaker failed uh, to mention that uh, the, uh, during the opium uh, situation in China, uh, the, it wasn't simply England that was involved in that. It was England, it was the Netherlands, it was Germany, uh, and it was the United States, and possibly a couple of others that were involved in cashing in in the opium uh, crisis. And uh, it wasn't until that Mao Zedong's revolution in uh, 1949, I think, when they finally dumped all the opium in the water and they forbid anyone to use opium under penalty of death. So uh, that was the only way they got rid of of the commonplace of opium in China. Uh, I think it's good that China has made great strides, and I think it's only since they adopted capitalist policies that made it possible for them to, uh, to, to be uh, uh, successful uh, to, the, to the extent that they have, and I think that um, as long as they maintain capitalist policies in China, they will continue to be successful. Uh, by the way, uh, England went uh, socialist after World War II, and they've gone downhill tremendously. It, uh, it certainly never did them any good. So I think that uh, while uh, Russia held to socialism, and they, they went downhill real bad, and finally failed, uh, China has, has done the opposite and they've done very, very well. So I want to applaud China for, uh, for being as successful as they have. And that's all I've got to say. Excellent. Uh, I just want to briefly comment on China. Um, first of all, the new kids on the block, the biggest guy around, they're going to be around for a long time, forever. And we have to find a, a good way to get along um, to get along with them and to understand them better is to briefly comment on their history as far as i go back go back to the huns start with them when the huns invaded them all they want to do is push them out they just didn't necessarily want to conquer anybody they just leave alone leave us alone we have our own little entity our own little world here and the huns left and they kind of kept them going centuries later the mongols came same thing, push them out, leave us alone. They built this huge monster wall along the north side of their, their, their country to keep people out, not, 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 not to fight with them. Later on, the Europeans came along the ports. They want to open up for trade. They said, nothing doing, no. Get away, leave us alone. We, we, we don't have nothing to do with you. So this went on for a while, but of course the 17th, 18th, 19th century, 20th century, it was opened up. World War One, World War Two, and so forth. Now they have a revolution in the late 40s. Well, I'll see you in 1949. I think they, they won. I think it was 49, 1949. What did he do? 
He shut the borders all down. He says, nothing. Leave us alone. We don't want to do it with anybody. We have to understand that point. They want their, 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 their space. And we have to learn how to understand that because we're going to be dealing with these people forever now. And we have to find out how to deal with the big problem that's going to come up within our lifetime. We're going to see that thing. Is Taiwan. They go on Taiwan. Taiwan is Chinese. It's not Japanese. It's not American. Although we had our ships circling it. We're going to find some way to deal with this issue peacefully. Because I can't see us having 200 warships circling Taiwan for, for 30, 40 years. Doing what? So we're going to end up giving it to them and eventually. We have to find a peaceful solution to this. We have to find out their, their space. What we can do and how to deal with this problem is going to be a major problem in the future. But mainly, China sort of has their own energy. You know, they don't really, I mean, now they're, they're moving out. They're going everywhere. I mean, we have to be aware of that. There's a lot of dangerous situations existing here that we haven't can't even mention. But that's the main theme I think we should concentrate on. to hear the uh, derogatory comparison between the United States and China. China is an authoritarian, not democracy, where there's no such thing as free speech or any other freedom of organization or anything else. Here we go. And, uh, and if one does try to fight for one's rights, one is thrown into jail. Yeah. Capital punishment is very widespread, much more even than in this country. Also, China has um, does spend a lot of money on armaments. It's trying to build all the same weapons that we have. Oh, sorry. And uh, its economy is widely criticized as being unbalanced. Yes, they have a lot of infrastructure, and that's fine and good. But there are other things that have been neglected, and people that move from the countryside, and many have, into the cities for jobs and so forth, have been badly discriminated against, looked down upon, and so forth. Pollution, air pollution at least, is a major problem there. I've read about it extensively. And uh, something like uh, pea soup, uh, um, fox, and things like this. Uh, and as far as train stations, I don't know if the city has ever visited Union Station in Chicago, but it's a fantastically architectural gem. Who could find something better than Union Station? Yeah. I don't know. Good. Next. Who's next? Who's next? Who oh, can find anything better? <laughs> Hi, thanks for the travel log. It was interesting. Um, happy to see the improvements. Um, what you were talking about, uh, $1.90 a day is the poverty level. That must be a really low level of living because $1.90 a day doesn't buy much here. Um, so that was interesting too. I guess there's a lot you don't know of from a distance because we have our own our own level of of uh, <coughs> sustenance. Um, the idea, though, that uh, that China is a uh, is somehow is somehow a close to heaven is um, it's incomplete. Uh, the, the nine dashes that they put in the South China Sea, they call the nine dash, where they took over the whole, they claim all of the South China Sea adjacent to Vietnam, up to adjacent to the Philippines, and adjacent to the Singapore. And that's not a peaceful thing. Um, they built <coughs> islands there and everything. That's, that's not a peaceful thing. The um, Tiananmen Square, you know, the 30th anniversary is coming up soon. And 
it was it was not a peaceful thing. Um, the idea that <coughs> nobody has cash, everybody has phones, puts it on the phone, strikes me as like 1984. It's like somebody knows everything you're spending and where you're spending it and da da da. The nice thing about cash is nobody knows. Okay? And another nice thing about cash is you can use it when electricity goes down. Um, yeah, China, I'm happy that they've moved, that, they're, that they have progressed. Um, but in no way, shape, or form do I believe that they're a peaceful nation that's close to, close to heaven. Um, I was reading recently about a tourist, tourist excursion up the Mekong Delta. And they were talking about how this guy was a Vietnam vet, and he has he has gone back to see it, and he was talking about how the quality of the river changed, and it changed because the Chinese built some dams to generate electricity, and much like we did to the Colorado, okay, but they also extended the that new Chinese plan, the one chi the one road, one belt, one road, one belt, one road into Laos, and this guy reported on his travel log, he goes, this, what was, what he heard back from the locals was that this plan is from China, of China, and for China. He said that they came in, they had the plan, all the companies that worked on it were Chinese. All of the Chinese money that came into it was paid to Chinese companies, and all the laborers were Chinese. And the, and the country, Laos, was just left with the dead. And then the same thing happened to um, Sil the little country off of uh, India, Ceylon, I think, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, where they had to lease a port back to China for 99 years because they got into so much debt with this one belt thing. This is not near heaven. And of course the other thing is um, well, it slips. But I'm happy to see that just like Americans, they're fat and jolly, you know. And I'm happy to see that the people who live there are under the illusion that they that there's a benevolent government. Um, I don't see a benevolent government anywhere. Um, I mean, the, the easiest way for me to say it is like Animal Farm. At the end of Animal Farm, the animals are looking. One side is the pigs, the other side is the humans. And I'm not saying which is which. I'm just saying they're all the same. You know. So China. It's like West Virginia almost heaven. You're going China almost heaven. No. I'm gonna go next. I'm gonna go next, Andy. Yeah, I won't need a couple minutes here. I'm gonna restart our projector. Okay. It's kind of amazing. What happens here at the College of Complexes, as soon as that projector comes back up, I'm going to show you a little bit about what happened here from last week, particularly on the videos that we get at the College of Complexes all the time. Um, turns out that I had recently, may not come up yet, but, uh, you know, as soon as we... Uh, as soon as we get, okay, there we go. I'm sorry, I got the, uh, it's going to take a minute here to pull up. Hopefully we have it. But according to our recent college uh, video from last week, which would be the Sandy Hook Posner versus Fetcher lawsuit and why it matters, there is one thing that has been kind of funny. This has only been up about two days, and we're close to about 400 plus views on this video. In fact, it's probably one of the biggest 
most uh, successful launches of the College of Complexes video stream. There's also been some com there's also been some comments on it already, at least six or eight of them, and they're all talking about uh, Sandy Hook and everything else. Sure, sure. And it's a basically surprising me that this topic would be quite, uh, how shall we say, quite uh, controversial and popular amongst our own vast library of uh, college videos. Now, I could log into my YouTube account right now and show you, but still, the most successful videos we've had, I think the Posner one's going to be up there, but it was still the Moon Landing Hoax by Ted Aranda and the Thorium Molten Salt Reactors we did with John Kutch back in 2012. As far as China today, I think our best look at the picture was when we had our Chinese ambassador here from when he came here and, and took us to the college. Even when I put that one up, it took almost a month to get about 100 views on it. And I'm surprised it really didn't go anywhere because that was one of the best uh, things we ever had. Anyway, all, I, all I'm saying is it still surprises me what gets really popular here at the College of Complexes. And uh, what really is not what we would like to be popular, which is all of our political stuff. It seems like in anywhere else, if it bleeds, it leads. And certainly last week was controversial enough that it would make one of the more popular videos going on. But I also think that Mr. Fetzer is probably uh, highly promoting it on his website too, because he's been after me for at least three days after the thing to get it up right away. Anyway, thank you very much. Who's next? You're going to be next. Anybody got any other rebuttal? Becomes a charm. <coughs> Charlie's Ready next. Up next? Yes, Charlie. Up All right. Go ahead and plan that. So let's thank our speaker very much. A nice putting together all kinds of slides. Okay, and a nice commentary there. I'll be collecting as usual here. Um, I particularly enjoyed the landscapes, which have been the topic and generate any number of poems and, and paintings, landscape paintings, which I've enjoyed viewing over the years uh, of the Chinese culture, and which I recommend everyone take advantage of if you get to an art gallery. The landscapes on which these locations were based uh, certainly have been a source of inspiration to artists. Uh, before we start applauding incipient <coughs> capitalism, I've been studying lately the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, beginning in the late 1800s, 1760, as my friend says, uh, in Great Britain, and I can see that uh, the, cap the onset of capitalism has not improved over the centuries and still has the nefarious elements it has always had in terms of alleged prosperity, but prosperity at what cost and expense to the people. I have not seen any reports of improved working conditions in the, in the nation of China, uh, uh, which was not the topic of the program tonight, uh, but they still have not allowed anyone access to the manufacturing facilities of this nation to truly ascertain what is going on within that produces this 3% or 6% per year. The price tag of that, I think, I, I would not want to look at. Uh, there has been no progress in that regard, nor do I, when we had the, the, the chairman here from the embassy, uh, did I find any evidence of their wanting to embrace human rights or expand the rights of the working conditions of the people. Uh, the same thing they did in the past, they recruited from the countryside to the cities. This is still going on. 
taking advantage of rural people, especially younger people, uh, having them live in the dormitory conditions with, with the 15 hour days or longer uh, in dormitory fashion. And it's the same identical thing. Great Britain actually was industrialized initially using orphans. They clean the orphanages. So I tell you, that's, a, that's where you come in, you're plotting this. You don't, you don't want socialism, you want capitalism that uses orphans. They, they applaud it, they say, oh, this is great. We, get, we, get, we don't have to have these orphans feeding these orphans. We can put them, we give them in nice jobs in these factories. This is what the industrialists in Great Britain did. And you know what, socialism in Great Britain, that's why they ended up with socialism. Because people said, people like this are just no good. And the system they're embracing is no good. But anyhow, uh, it's a little hard to say go, um, to go from cities and the, country and, the, and the park system, which you spent a lot of time, and people do that on vacation, but it's a little bit, a bit like saying you, you went to Madison Avenue or Fifth Avenue, and then you went to Niagara Falls, and that's not the United States, you know. But anyhow, you had a vacation, a typical one, and it looks like you had a good time. You really covered a lot of distance, so. All right, thank you very much. All right. Coffee, yeah. That was good. And I got to yell at you guys. And you're dead wrong like always, Charlie. Yeah. I'll leave a, a couple of comments that weren't mentioned. Uh, for those of you that have been following it, uh, China had some cities among the school strikers uh, for the climate. The number, number of countries is growing. And even uh, throughout China, where there's supposed to be people or you know have no rights or police state, whatever was, uh, they have school strikers also that are striking on Friday for the future. Also, the Chinese government, for those of you that aren't aware yet, the Chinese government is looking toward uh, mitigating the effects of uh, loss loss of land on their coastal cities. Uh, 20, 30 years from now, as climate change gets worse. So in China, China as a country appears to be one of the countries in the forefront of planning to do something about global warming and uh, coordinate with the rest of the world on uh, cutting down burning fossil fuel. That's why you saw pictures of huge solar and wind farms in China. China is a leader, a world leader in putting up photovoltaic panels. So the kids all over the world are teaching their parents and backed by scientists everywhere that the future for all countries belongs to solar and wind power and we have to do, move fast but the solutions are all here <coughs> excuse me so uh, September 24th I think it is is going to be the, the third or maybe September 20th look up whichever Friday that is there's a, another large a bigger global Fridays for the future walk out with students and this time they're backed by hundreds of climate scientists and other scientists from big companies that are calling for a work stoppage not only are the schools right you know the kids walking out of school on friday but they're advising the whole country and adults that are working you know, if you're not in a critical job like ER are in a hospital or something like that if you can spare a day from work take a day off join the students and help get the uh, ball rolling on uh, our country moving in the direction of doing something about climate change. So, yes, uh, David? Yeah, uh, I just have one question, Andy. Sure. Uh, don't you think that a country as big and as powerful as China uh, is that they could leave a little old man in his province to fuck alone. I'm talking about the Dalai Lama and Tibet. Well, I, I can't comment on that. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, the I, Dalai heard, Lama. Yeah, I've heard of him. Tibet. But, but what... Uh, they went in and took it over. Okay, well, what does that have to do with climate change? Well, I wasn't talking about climate change. Oh, yeah. So, you know, what point I'm trying to make, and then our speaker will come up, is that there's thousands of problems we all talk about. 
the number one problem if we don't solve it renders everything else irrelevant within just a few years from now. So uh, those of you that are interested in seeing what the future looks like and what we can do about it, uh, come to my talk on June 29th about the Green New Deal. We're collecting information day by day for that talk. It's going to be, it'll be different than anything I've ever given here. Thank you. And uh, our speaker can come up and have the last word. All right, good, you know. Okay, well thank you. Um, a lot of you said things that I was not talking about in my presentation, so I didn't talk about Shijan or Tibet or a lot of the other things. I was talking about what I saw in China. By you just mentioned the Dalai Lama. I could talk about some of these things. The Dalai Lama used to be on the CIA payroll. You know that? Yeah. Yeah. He says that himself in an interview. He got half a million dollars a year, and it continued until Nixon went to meet with Mao, and that was a condition that Mao put on that. Well, the main thing I'd want you to get that I got out of China is that China is going up like this and the United States is going like that. And China is surpassing the United States. And that was pretty obvious to me when I was there. And the U.S. very soon, or maybe now, is not number one anymore. Someone else in the world is number one. And we lived all our lives the U.S. being number one. And we've lived over 500 years where the white people have been number one on the earth. And now that is ending. And of course, they don't like it at all. And so they're going to say all sorts of garbage about China because they want to stop this. And they cannot stop it. And I think the best way to look at it is what Jimmy Carter said to Trump about what to do about China. Carter said, well, the U.S. has basically been at war for 216 years out of its history. China has been at war well, uh, maybe almost every year since the 70s, late 70s. China has not been at war in over uh, 30 or 40 or 50, well, 49? Um, they are not spending all that money on war and wasting it. They're investing it in improving their country. United States is not doing that. And what you see now is a consequence of these policy of the United States. And the U.S. is going to continue on these policies. Their only answer to problems is war. But I think that's the real thing I saw when I was in China. And it's kind of obvious that the U.S. is, is no, but as soon as not going to be number one anymore. China is. Um, I would have said nothing like China is a peaceful, well, Jimmy Carter said China is a peaceful nation. I never said anything about it being close to heaven. I'm just talking about, I could talk about things like, well, in terms of human rights, retirement age for women in China is 50. The retirement age for men, I think, is 55 or 60, which we thankfully have the human right to be able to work until we're 80 if we want. Around this. A lot of, you know, the only thing we hear in this country about China is negative. And why is it negative? It's because the U.S. sees China as a threat. And so when they see the country as a threat, they're always going to, you got to hate this place and you got to fight this place because they're a threat. But they're not really addressing the issue of, you know, it's, it's not a the only reason it's a threat is because it's developing independently of the U.S. system. And the U.S. is kind of, our wealth is based on control of the world economy, and we're losing it. China is already in number one uh, exporter of goods in the world. It's got good relations with a lot of countries around the world. And I could go into that thing about Sri Lanka, which I just read about, that I think between 6 or 15 percent of Sri Lanka's foreign debt is to China. 
most of it is to Western countries. But of course, they're all going to say, well, as China's doing this, we're just like innocent. Western countries never ripped off the third world. Oh, no. it's China. So, I mean, that's all I can say is uh, I won't say anything more. All right. Who wants candy? Can you gamble us out, please? All right. Very good. We know all about China. All right. Okay. College of Complexes is officially adjourned. Okay. And thank you very much for your time this evening. All right. Thank you for your time. And uh, college stands adjourned. You should tell me when when was the ambassador?